severe asceticism, like the circle of Hassan did. But we can see that here also the emphasis is on the innate faculty of intelligence for merit and demerit, for reward and punishment. But it's mitigated somewhat by the fact that God can perfect it in those whom he favors. So there is a determinist element implied. Well, it's a complicated issue, and I'm not here to talk about the issue of Qadr, but I'm trying to display that the authentic context for this narrative has nothing to do with a first intellect in a cosmic scheme. How would you explain the Iqbal and the Idbar, the facing forward and the turning back, from the point of view of a Neoplatonic scheme? It doesn't fit. This is, in fact, an utterly indigenous Islamic context dealing with the main theological issue of the time, the issue of whether my acts affect my own salvation through my own ability, qudra, power, will, and what is the role of God's will in all of this or of his foreknowledge in all of this. Because here God seems to know that in some people he will perfect them you will perfect the faculty of aqal. So he has some sort of ilm, pre-knowledge about who he might choose to perfect the knowledge of. And then if we take this into context with another popular teaching also about intelligence, we have number three here on this page. A pupil of Ibn Abbas, one of the important companions who was noted for his exegetical commentary and his legal teaching, and represented the early school of Mecca, by the way. He was a member of Benu Hashim. He belonged to the Prophet's family. He was the son of the Prophet's uncle. This man reports in a manner that shows he's reporting an earlier saying. Balagani, it reached me that al-Aql was divided into a thousand parts. Muhammad was granted 999, and his community was given only one part Likewise, the prophets before him saved that which God excelled Muhammad with, for God elected the prophets on account of their innate reason, intelligence, wisdom. How should we translate the term? Well, it might help us to recall that the old rabbis used to say that God created bina, understanding, wisdom, in 50 portions. He gave Moses 49, and he divided the remaining portion among the Israelites. It seems to fit into that old notion, a Semitic notion, by the way, of chokhmah, wisdom. And we should call, recall that wisdom has a pre-creation status in Judaic and Christian teachings, and we'll come to that now. I would like to take a small detour and recall that these type of materials in praise of intelligence were early on collected. In fact, there are about six or seven books with the title Kitab al-Aql, Book of Innate Intelligence. Almost all are not extant. One from the third century, ninth century, by a Baghdadi savant named Ibn Abidunya is extant, and this type of creation narrative is found in it. Another one, it was written by an important early proto-Sufi thinker, Al-Muhasibi, in the early third century in Baghdad. And it has a number of hadith in it of this type in praise of Al-Aql. And it was called Mahiyat Al-Aql Wa Haqiqatuhu, the essence of intelligence and its reality. And it was a work written against the Mu'tazilites and <laughs> against the rationalist theologians and upheld the the view that it's an instinctive faculty provided by God in varying degrees to people, and it's akin to light. And so it's an innate faculty of perception. And here you have this, the light mysticism of the Eastern Father seems to have had an impact on this. And you can find uh, many statements in people like Evagrios of Pontos and St. John of Damascus and some of the medical monks in the Eastern Church that make a, 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 a glorification of nose as innate light and as a lamp in the body, etc. And it seems that there seems to be some parallelism going on here, which is natural, of course. And if we understand also that uh, the great monastic centers of the East, when they were subsumed under the Islamic umbrella, they tended to lose some of their impetus and some of their creativity and become 
more marginalized and fossilized over time, but a lot of their energy seems to have been transferred into Muslim circles. But that's another issue. I won't go into it too much. So Hassan had a very important disciple named Abdul Wahid ibn Zayd. He is a notorious Qadari theologian and is said to have been the first man to build a Sufi monastery in southern Iraq off the coast of the Shat al-Arab near where Basra is now. There's an island. It's called Abbadan. Uh, during the Iraq-Iran war, it was decimated because it was near the Fal Peninsula. It's totally destroyed now. But at one time, it was famous for the production of very good quality reed mats. And the people <coughs> used to weave these a thousand years ago were these ascetics. They retired there to this island and they lived in little, what they call somia or ribat, little uh, conventicles. And they earned their living by weaving mats and then they pursued intense devotions and self-mortifications. These were the Qadaris, the proto-Sufis actually. Uh, and their material was of this type. These were the teachings that they narrated as statements by companions going back to the Prophet which praised the virtue of intelligence as the chief organ for worship. Look at number two on this page. This is a famous utterance by these sages. God is not worshipped with anything more surpassing than al-aql. This is a famous statement, widespread, attributed to many people, even going back to a Luqmanic origin. And if we go page number eight. I'm jumping around a little bit. We have this very interesting narrative which comes from the book that the disciple of Abdul Wahid wrote. His name was Daoud ibn al-Muhabbar and he wrote one of the early Aql books, Kitab al-Aql, which was debated and discussed by the critics and declared to be a notorious forgery where all the material in it which was attributed to the Prophet Muhammad was fake and that the Isnads had been fabricated and that all the utterances and teachings in them could never have been said by the Prophet because he was opposed to this kind of thinking. That was the official consensus of the Sunni experts in tradition, the Ashab al-Hadith, the guardians of tradition, if you will. But this narrative gives us a better insight into the way the Qadari mind works. Uh, the, the set is that this Jewish convert, Abdullah ibn Salam, is questioning the Prophet there's a whole genre of this type of sayings of Ibn Salam to the Prophet, usually dealing with uh, themes that come from Old Testament or a rabbinic teaching, about the throne, Al-Arsh, the greatest of all of the creations of God. And the Prophet informs Ibn Salam that there is a greater creation than the throne. It's called Al-Aql. Even the angels don't know the true grandeur and eminence of Aql. Knowledge of it cannot be fully comprehended. God is said to tell the angels. Do you have no number of grains of sand? Truly I created aql as diverse sorts, like the number of grains of sand. Of that I give some people a single grain, some two or three. To some I give a whole sack. I give to some of them a camel's load, wasak. To some two loads, to some even more. These are all terms of measure, dry measure. Okay? And then Ibn Salam asks, who are the ones who receive the most? And the Prophet said, those who labor in accordance with obedience to God are given measures of aql in proportion to their deeds and their diligence and their certitude and in proportion to the light God placed in their hearts. Their custodian and all of that is the intelligence which God provided them. Thus, in proportion to that measure of intelligence provided them by God, the worker among them labors and rises in degrees. This is a very interesting statement which sketches a kind of uh, religious or mystical vision of the Qadari thought world. The harder you work, the harder you pray, the harder you fast, the higher position in paradise you earn as a direct result of your efforts. I know I'm taking more time than I should, but the mention of throne is very significant because as I mentioned before, there's an ancient wisdom. So this is a, another insight into how the narrative could be exploited. Now, in the next uh, uh, several centuries, uh, this basic creation narrative was seized upon and used among 
early Sufi thinkers, among Ismaili thinkers, and among later some moral philosophers or ethical thinkers who had religious concerns, but were also open to Hellenic ideas. But if we look at, uh, I just mentioned ex an example, the Druze religion, which is a splinter from the Ismaili uh, movement, a radical esoteric aspect of Shiism, which founded its own caliphate in North Africa and became a kind of anti-caliphate, almost succeeded in uh, displacing the Abbasid Caliphate at one point. Uh, the Fatimid Imams in Cairo, they built Cairo, who was their capital. They, uh, they had a splinter group of heretics from their perspective who deified one of their caliphs, Al-Hakim bi Amrullah, and they wrote their scriptures, which were basically letters and epistles between their own leaders and their followers. Their chief cosmological writing in the so-called Rasa'il al-Hikmah the secret Druze scriptures, which are still secret today, although during the Lebanese Civil War, the Maronite Christians published them and to show, divulge the oddity and, and uh, peculiarity of the secret uh, beliefs of the Druze. But I had the good fortune to uh, examine a, a genuine copy of the epistles from a Druze friend and uh, confirm the, the accuracy of what the, uh, the publication uh, by the Maronites uh, claimed to be. Their main cosmology is, is uh, detailed in a book called Keshf al Hakaik, Revelation of Mysteries. And it's taking this narrative about the creation of the intellect, interpreting it in a Neoplatonic sense, and making it into the frame for the whole history of the universe. This was not peculiar. Later thinkers like Ibn Sab'in, a famous Andalusian mystic, also concentrated on this narrative and expanded it into a frame for their whole philosophy. But when did this new Platonic element enter? According to Goldseyer, it was native, it was original. When we look at Kindi, who was the first major Muslim philosophical mind, talk about al-aqal al-awwal, the first intellect, at least from what survives of his writings, we have no indication that he had recourse to this narrative. It could have been useful for him in his project to marry Hellenic and popular Neoplatonic teaching onto an Islamic basis, because Kindi understood the Neoplatonic one, al-wahid al-haq al-awwal, the first real one, to be the same as the Quranic God, Allah. And he said there's no contradiction between philosophy and religion. And uh, later one of Kindi's pupils, I mean the third generation from Kindi in the school of Kindi, Abu al-Hassan al-Amari, who was from Central Asia, and second sheet of your handout. You can see how he developed that insight that philosophy and religion are, are go hand in hand. A deen is sahih wal aqal is sarih. Authentic religion and clear reason. You have this set of polarities. Wahi aqal, revelation reason. Milali hikmi, faith-based, wisdom-based, or philosoph philosophical-based. Shar'i falsafi, uh, legal, religious, uh, really revealed law, and philosophical uh, insight. And for him, there was no contradiction. He has his uh, scheme of uh, philosophical uh, topics is uh, integrating the traditional Islamic revealed sources into a Hellenic uh, curriculum to some extent. Practical philosophy, of course, is ethics. Uh, Middlely, uh, religious teaching uh, has, uh, has the three, so to speak, epistemological bases, sensory, hissi, akli, uh, rational, intelligible, and then a mix of both, sensory and intelligible. So, for example, hissi in the religious sciences is the art of the traditionists who translate, transmit the <coughs> statements of the prophet. Then the lawyers, the jurists, have a, a discipline which relies on both senses and mind, because after all, ijma and qiyas are sources of legal rulings and, and uh, decisions in Islam. They are not necessarily sensory. And then, of course, aqli would be the theological approach to religious knowledge. And then you have the hikmi on the right, the philosophic set of uh, uh, disciplines, and you have the physicists, you have the mathematicians and the logicians, and then you have the uh, divine thinkers or the theological or 
philosophical discipline of metaphysics, uh, what Kindi called Ilm al rububiyya or Ilahi, Ilm al Ilahi, according to Ibn Sina. And very interestingly, he, he separates from the Milali and Hikmi the ala, the instrument which is used, an epistemological tool, to arrive at the content of those disciplines for, uh, uh, for the linguistic uh, and uh, liter literary uh, Arabic language-based tool, which is central to the religious disciplines. And then you have the logic tool, you know, this Aristotelian uh, logic and the organon, which is basic to the philosophical enterprise. So this type of impetus was carried out and uh, worked out in a certain, with a certain type of uh, consistency in the school of Kindi. By the way, it's, it's, it's likely that, I mean, Ibn Sina is another school, so to speak, another wave in, in Islamic philosophical thinking. But people like Ghazali may have been more interested or impressed by the Kindian approach, although they seem to have occupied themselves a lot with Ibn Sina's approach. So we have early on in the second, uh, third century of Islam, the ninth century, at the same time that the guardians of tradition are condemning the Mu'tazili and branding Daud ibn al-Muhabbar and these Qadari narratives from a century before as forgeries and fakes, we have the stirrings of Islamic philosophical Hellenic uh, thought through people like Kindi. Uh, uh, less than a century later, we have the great Farabi, and he was prime, much more of a logician than Kindi was. Kindi was eclectic and was interested in hermetic and other popular types of disciplines. And his Neoplatonism is, is not a pure Neoplatonism. But again, we don't find that Farabi, who did have recourse to hadith and sometimes quotes the Quran, as far as we know in his extant works, did not use this hadith. Who used it? Miskaway. A little bit uh, later than Ibn Sina, I'm sorry, a contemporary of Ibn Sina, a generation and a half or two after Farabi, a great uh, ethical thinker. I mean, he spent the first half of his life trying to perfect the art of alchemy, but he, he failed. So he turned his attention to uh, philosophical ethics. And he quotes this hadith, but he quotes it in the form of lemma khalaqa, still. He understands that it's a narrative that is dealing with some form of ethical teaching. Ibn Sina, is noted for his exploitation of this hadith, this creation narrative, and other such type narratives about intellect. And he quotes it in the form, awwalu ma khalaqa, the first that God created. And of course, he weaves it into his uh, neoplatonic-based uh, cosmology to some extent, uh, and uses its exegesis as a tool for vehicling his own philosophical system. And, uh, but he does that in a manner that shows that the hadith had become detached from its original context. Whenever it's quoted in the form, the first <coughs> thing that God created, it is never provided with an isnad. It's not given as a narrated report connected back to the prophet in the traditional manner. Because it can't be. Because the original form was when God created. But the change into awwaluma, the first that God created, would be a, an adaptation or a uh, development that came later. When we consider that the Sunni <coughs> tradition has expunged this hadith, they have denied it any legitimacy. The growing consensus of the critics, if you go through all those voluminous materials and extract the statements about Dawood and about this hadith and about the other narrators and the isnads of this hadith, you will collect all that stuff uh, in a filter and you'll find out that there's a, a growing trend. In the beginning they say, well, he was very pious, he was uh, very virtuous, but, you know, he had bad methodology, he was loose in his hadith, he didn't check the isnad carefully. And then a generation or two later they say he was a liar. And a generation or two later they say he was a notorious Mu'tazili and despicable and, and uh, to be rejected entirely. So they've, they've reached a consensus that anyone who was involved in transmission of these type of materials claiming some kind of prophetic status was disreputable. Although in the original assessment of these individuals by people much closer to their era, they were understood to be well-intentioned, but you know they, they played uh, loose with the methodology that the guardians of tradition preferred. 
I'll give you an example. There was a famous critic. His name was Yazid ibn Zuraya in the late second century. He came across a class of traditions that said, if you recite this, hadith, this Quranic verse so many times, you go to paradise. This is a very common class of popular hadith in Islam. He said, look, the Prophet did not say these things. It's not a mechanical process. You get to paradise by saying 1,000 times. So he's, he went to the people who related these hadith. He said, who did you hear it from? They said, from X over in Walsit. He went to Walsit. He said, who did you hear it from? He said, from Y in Abadan. He went to Abadan. He met the chief Sufi there. He said, are you saying these hadith? He said, yes, we invented them. We put them in circulation. He said, you admit to being a liar and putting words into the mouth of the prophet? He said, it's not like that, my son. He said, look what the people are doing. They're reading the seerah of Ibn Ishaq and the fiqh of Abu Hanifa. They're reading you know, prophetic biographies and legal uh, books. And they're forgetting about the Quran. So we're trying to incite them to go back and study and make the Quran central in their religious life. We're doing this for God's sake. We will be rewarded for this. It was a whole different attitude towards the discipline of hadith that these mystics had, right? Uh, the, and they're not interested in the isnad very much, right? So, of course, Yazid determined that these are fabrications by these Qadari Sufis, and therefore they're to be rejected. That's just an example of the difference in attitude towards knowledge. The same people, by the way, on Abadan, some of them had begun their career as collectors of hadith in the traditional search for knowledge. They had their notebook. They traveled around from one center to another. They audited the hadith. They recorded them. Then someone explained to them, what you want is deep knowledge, marifa. You don't want just recording of sayings without comprehension. So throw your book away and devote yourself to ascetic disciplines. And all you need is half a dozen hadith if you lived them and guide your life by them, you don't need anything else. When this was explained to people like Ibn Hanbal, the great uh, jurist and lawyer of Baghdad who founded one of the main law schools, the Han uh, Hanbali school, he was dumbfounded. He couldn't understand. Why would they throw away their notebook? They collected for years this precious material of the prophetic teaching, and they throw it away, or they, they wash it in water so that the paper can be reused, but they can't burn it or destroy it because it has the word of God on it. It's like, you know, the Geniza manuscript fragments. They can't destroy it because it's, it has a sacred word on it. So this is a, a showing a whole different approach to knowledge. Now, uh, I have used up more than I, the time I should, but what I'm going to do is end the last five minutes, if I may, talking about one feature of this hadith which shows the complexity of this transition from indigenous Muslim uh, wrestling with the problem of uh, uh, theodicy and human responsibility in which it's an eminently sound and uh, native Muslim teaching. And although you cannot prove that it's a prophetic statement, you can certainly place it in the circles of leading companions in the late first century. That's easy to do if you are adept at a SNAD analysis. Okay? And not just in Iraq, but in the Hejaz, and in Syria, too, where there was a circle of Qadari teach, uh, teachers who were in touch with certain companions. So it seems to be widespread. So it was developed and cultivated by the proto-Sufis, the Sunnis. It was embraced by the Shiites. 